Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, that are known as Tarquin the Proud, was the last Roman king, and the person who would be responsible for giving the Romans their hatred for anything resembling a king for centuries after his death. He is consistently referred to as a tyrant, whose eventual overthrow was not only justified, but necessary for the survival of the Roman state. But how true are these accounts? Was Tarquin actually a tyrant? And was his overthrow justified or necessary? Let's talk about it. Before we get any further into today's episode, I just want to quickly ask that you subscribe and like if you enjoy my content. It really helps the channel out, and it motivates me to make more content. Also, follow me on Twitter to get updates about any videos in progress. Now back to your regularly scheduled programming. As has become the norm for this series, I want to quickly note here that we should take much of these stories with a bit of skepticism. Many of the deeds, and even the people themselves in the histories of this period, may not have been real, or may not have happened in the way we are told they did. Just keep that in mind as we talk about Tarquin. Today, we are going to discuss Tarquin's actual reign, and in the next episode we will discuss his overthrow and his period of exile. Tarquin was said to be the son of Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, Rome's fifth king. However, the chronology that we are given concerning the regal period makes this essentially impossible. Instead, it is much more likely that Tarquin was the grandson of Lucius Priscus, instead of being his son. Remember that Tanaquil, Lucius Priscus' wife, had skipped over the sons or grandsons of the fifth Roman king in favor of Servius Tullius. It's very likely that this infuriated Tarquin, and this anger was likely the reason that Tarquin and Arnus Tarquinius, Tarquin's brother, would marry two daughters of Servius. Tarquin would be married to Tullia Minor, or Tolia the Younger. The two were both extremely ambitious, and we are told that nearly as soon as they were married, the two began to plot against their king, Servius Tullius. The first step in overthrowing Servius was to gain the support of the Senate. To do this, Tarquin started with the families and senators who had been given their positions by his grandfather. Remember that Lucius Priscus had raised roughly 100 men from the leading minor families to senatorial rank. We are told that these families were very loyal to Priscus during his rule. Tarquin believed that he would be able to inherit that loyalty, and it seems that he was correct. I imagine that Servius's reforms likely did not help all that much. At some point, Tarquin felt that he had secured enough support to launch his coup, and he arrived at the Senate House with a group of armed men. Tarquin set himself on the throne within the Senate, which was typically reserved for the king or the presiding officer inside the Senate and ordered the senators to the house. When the senators arrived, Tarquin launched into a speech deriding Servius as a slave born of a slave for failing to be elected by the senate and the people during an interregnum, as had been the tradition for the election of kings of Rome, for having become king through the machinations of a woman, for favoring the lower class of Rome over the wealthy, and for taking the land of the upper classes for distribution to the poor and for instituting the census, so that the wealth of the upper class might be exposed in order to incite popular envy. As you can probably imagine, this quickly caught the attention of some supporters of Servius, and word quickly reached the king. Servius hurried to the senate house to defend himself. Tarquin was unapologetic when faced with the king. He leveled the same accusations, and we are told that Tarquin eventually picked the elder king up and tossed him down the senate stairs and into the street below. The king's retainers fled, and Servius was murdered in the street by the group of armed men that Tarquin had brought with him that day. We are told that Tullia showed up in a chariot shortly after, and hailed her husband as king. Tarquin, seeing that a crowd had started to gather, told her to quickly return back to their home to ensure that no harm came to her. Tullia listened, and began to return home. However, her driver came upon the body of Servius, and was so shocked that he paused in the middle of the street to stare at the body. Tullia was enraged, and we are told that she took the reins of the chariot herself and drove it over the body of her father. The blood of the dead king splattered the chariot and the clothes that Tullia wore. The street where all of this occurred would be known as the Vicus Solerithus, or Street of Crime, even into the modern day. Tarquin ascended to the kingship in 534 BCE, after his murder of Servius. His first acts were to refuse to bury the body of Servius, and to put to death a number of senators who he suspected as still being loyal to Servius. He would never replace those senators, 
and would never consult the remaining senators on matters of government. With this, he effectively neutered the Senate, and the body was no longer able to even attempt to rein Tarquin in. In another break with tradition, Tarquin would also judge cases of capital punishment without the advice of counselors. This terrified anyone who would even consider opposing Tarquin. To further secure his position on the throne, Tarquin would betroth his daughter, Tarquinia, to the princepsis, or prince, of Tusculum, Octavius Mamilius. At this time, Tusculum had become one of the most powerful Latin cities, and its power likely rivaled that of Rome. Tarquin's diplomacy with the Latins would continue early on in his reign. He invited the leaders of the leading Latin cities to meet in a grove that was considered sacred to Fernentinia. Fernentinia was a goddess who was seen as the protector of the Latin League, or the Latin Commonwealth. At this meeting, Tarquin was hoping to form a combined army consisting of both the Roman army and the armies of the leading Latin cities. This would hopefully be the first step in integrating the Latin cities into the growing Roman state. At the meeting, Turnus Herdonius, the leading citizen of Arsicia, spoke against Tarquin's arrogance and warned his fellow Latins against trusting the Roman king. Tarquin was furious, and he knew that if he wanted to obtain cooperation between the Latins and the Romans, he would need to get rid of Turnius. To do this, Tarquin bribed a servant of Turnius to store a large amount of swords and other such equipment within Turnius's lodgings. Tarquin then called the other Latin leaders to a meeting, where he accused Turnius of plotting to kill him. The Latin leaders accompanied Tarquin to Turnius's lodgings, where they discovered the swords placed by the bribed servant. As you can imagine, this was a bad look, and we are told that the leaders quickly assumed Turnius to be guilty, and he was sentenced to death. Turnius had a wooden frame or crate placed over his head. He was placed into a pool of water in the sacred grove, and finally, the crate was filled with stones. This weight forced Turnius to sink to the bottom of the pool, where he shortly drowned. Without Turnius in the way, Tarquin was able to convince the remaining Latin leaders to agree to a new treaty that furthered the friendship between the Latins and the Romans. We aren't told what all this treaty changed exactly, but we are told that soldiers from the various Latin towns would meet Roman soldiers in the same grove to form a united military force. Shortly afterward, Tarquin instigated a war against the Volsci. The Volsci were another Italic tribe that inhabited the southern portion of Latium. We are told that Tarquin was the first Roman leader to fight the Volsci, but he certainly would not be the last, as the Roman Republic would face off against the Volsci for the first few centuries of their existence. We are told that in this war, Tarquin took the wealthy city of Susia Palmedia. He would celebrate a triumph following his victory, where he would dedicate his spoils of war to building the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus that Lucius Priscus had vowed to build during his reign. He next turned his attention to the city of Gabi, a Latin city that had refused to sign the treaty between the Latins and the Romans. Tarquin was unable to take the city by force, and thus had to find some sort of way around the military might of Gabi. We are told that Tarquin sent one of his sons, Sextus, to the city, where Sextus claimed to be ill-treated by his father and convinced the leaders of the city that he wished to switch sides. Sextus would eventually gain the trust of the leaders and he'd be promoted to the leading general of the city. After this, he would send a messenger to his father asking him how he should proceed. The king was walking in his personal garden upon the arrival of the messenger, and instead of giving a verbal reply, he would strike the heads of the tallest poppies off using his walking stick. While the messenger did not understand the message, Sextus did. Tarquin was instructing his son to kill off the leading men of the city. Sextus quickly killed the leading class off, and with no one left in power who opposed him, he was able to quickly surrender the city to his father, thus securing victory for Rome. Tarquin would also agree to peace with the Aqui, an Italic tribe that lived in the Apennine Mountains, and renew the treaty between Rome and the Etruscans. We are also told that Tarquin celebrated a triumph over the Sabines, and would afterwards establish the colonies of Signi and Circei. Back in Rome, Tarquin flattened the Tarpian Rock, which was a cliff on the Capitoline Hill, and removed several ancient Sabine shrines in order to make room for his temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. He would also construct the first tiered seats in the Circus Maximus and ordered an expansion of the Colloquia Maxima, Rome's sewer system. 
we are also told that at some point Tarquin was approached by the Cumaean Sibyl. The priestess presiding over the Oracle of Apollo at Cumae, who offered him nine books of prophecies for a quote, exorbitant price. Tarquin refused to purchase the books, and the priestess burnt three of the books, after which she offered the remaining six books for the same price. Tarquin again refused, and again the priestess burnt three more books, and offered the remaining three at the same price. We are told that this time Tarquin consulted the augurs who not only urged him to buy the remaining three books, but also scolded him for allowing the first six to be burnt. These books would eventually become known as the Sabalide books. I'm sure you've probably heard of them. These books supposedly contain prophetic utterances and other pieces of advice that would save Rome during times of trouble. These books would be consulted during some of Rome's most famous wars and times of trouble, including the Second Punic War, after the Battle of Cannae, and even after the Great Fire of Rome in 64 CE. The books would exist until they were ordered to be destroyed by Stilicho in 405 CE. These books were quite possibly the most important and revered pieces of literature in the entire history of Rome. This is where we will pause our examination of Tarquin. Next time we will discuss his overthrow and the events concerning him after that. We should take this moment to examine his deeds up to this point to answer our questions from the beginning of the video. To be honest, so far Tarquin is essentially acting like any other Roman king, save for the events surrounding his ascent to the throne. The murder of Servius was certainly a black mark on Tarquin's record, but we should also remember that Romulus, for many Romans the greatest Roman to ever live, did something just as horrible in leading the rape of the Sabine women or murdering his own brother. I mean, Tullius Hostilius ripped a guy in half using two chariots. I'm not saying that what Tarquin did was not horrible or wrong, but if we are going to call Tarquin out on his horrible deeds, we should do the same to the rest of the Roman kings. And when you do that, suddenly Tarquin is not alone in committing horrible deeds. In terms of his actual rule, Tarquin's actually doing very well so far. He subdued the Latins in a way that no other Roman king had been able to do. Yes, it required some shady dealings, but in the end, this would start the sequence of events that would lead to Rome fully controlling Latium. The treaty between the Romans and the Etruscans was extended, and back in Rome, Tarquin continued to expand the city. So far, Tarquin seems to be a pretty good king, to be honest. We shall see how the rest of his reign proceeds. He still has plenty of time to ruin his image, after all. And of course, we all know how this story will end, with Tarquin being overthrown and the establishment of the Roman Republic. Join me next time as we see exactly what led to these events. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned something. I hope you will join me next time where we will discuss the last few years of Tarquin's reign and his eventual overthrow. If you have any comments or questions on the video, or believe I've made a mistake, please comment down below. And please like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. It really helps the channel out. Peace.